It's as if I went to sleep for a year. And when I woke up, the world's fallen apart. There is tremendous clamor for revenge, especially in the wake of the Red Wedding. Catelyn Stark's death, Richard Madden and Una Chaplin, that moment I knew it was coming and it killed, it ripped me up inside, I cried. I actually shed a tear that, yeah, I shed a tear. All the performances were, were extraordinary and it was very emotional to do. It's sort of where do you go from there? Some of the most shocking and mind-blowing scenes of the entire series come at the end of this coming season. Some very bloody confrontations. I know how important The Red Wedding is to so many fans of the show and the books, but we pick up the pieces and top it in many ways. This is definitely the most uh, dangerous season for Tyrion. It seems like almost every episode he's in jeopardy of getting his head removed from his shoulders. Tyrion has never been faced with this much public humiliation because he usually has an answer for it. I've talked myself out of a thousand dark corners, Podrick. I don't think I'm talking my way out of this one. He's usually center stage and he usually is better at it than the people around him. This time around, he's left as a, an audience member. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. There's no boundary with her and Tyrion of, of inflicting emotional damage. She's quite happy to do it. You've always pitied him, our poor little brother. He'd kill us all if he could. Tyrion and Jamie definitely have a love that Tyrion doesn't have with the other members of his family. And he helped Tyrion a great deal this season. Kel, I'm the last friend you've got. My favorite character is Bronn, Jerome Flynn. I really like Cersei because she's just a fantastic character and even though everyone hates her, you kind of love to hate her. Jamie Lannister, he's complex. The thing that Nikolai has is this incredible charisma. He was born to play that part. Oberyn Martell is the one wild card. I would describe Oberyn as a deeply passionate person. I think that he's very, very dangerous, but he's also good. I think Oberyn's feelings for the Lannisters go beyond disdain and then to hatred. Why did you come to King's Landing, Prince Oberyn? I was invited to the royal wedding. The Lannisters are the only ones who pay their debts. He uses the invitation to the wedding to come and seek out what he really wants, and that is vengeance. Joffrey. Joffrey's a wee prick. Mummy's boy, a bully. He's got nice eyes. Um, <laughs> I feel like Jack, the actor, has an abundance of redeeming qualities. I feel like Joffrey, the character, uh, uh, less so. He's kind of always sits like squiffy on his chair. He's like always picking it at the handle, and he's like, I am the king. <laughs> Joffrey, I mean, clearly the last person on Earth you would want to have any kind of power. I broke Stannis on the Blackwater. Pity you weren't there to help, Uncle. My apologies, Your Grace. I was rather busy. Busy getting captured. It's the best one to play such a hateful or hate-inspiring character. Just to get the reaction out of someone is uh, it's very satisfying. It's nice to, yeah, make people hate you. A royal wedding is history. Time has come for us all to contemplate our history. In terms of the challenge of the wedding, it's the entirety of it. It's the totality of a massive scene which takes up about half the episode. It was like shooting a short film in itself, actually. I was shocked by the sheer scale. I really have never seen anything like that in Game of Thrones before. I would find it very hard that I would have a wedding ceremony replicated like that again in my career. It was majestic, it was shimmering, and it just looked pristine. I think that's uh, what Joffrey likes. He likes he has something uh, ostentatious and grand. The great thing about this show is they like to put you into atmospheres and into environments that conjure up certain feelings inside of you when you're playing the scenes out. Your imagination is kind of fueled, it's all there. My throne room is a mini tropical version of a Westeros throne room. That set is unbelievable. I walked in and was like open mouthed for a good 10 minutes. Very intimidating. 
And the media is lovely, but you kind of look up at them and it's kind of frightening. She's exploring what kind of a leader she could be. How can I rule seven kingdoms if I can't control a single city? The cities that Danny has previously liberated are beginning to revolt because it's all well and good going in and cutting the tie and seemingly breaking people free, but if you don't leave them with any kind of a structure or any kind of a commander who shares the same morals and views as the person who liberated them, then it's a free-for-all. They can live in my new world or they can die in their old one. When the dragons were first born, they were adorable little babies and, and uh, completely devoted to their mother and they couldn't even eat without her. With each season they grow and with each season they become a little bit more dangerous. And now they're at the point where they're not babies anymore. They are outgrowing the restrictions that she's placing on them. She's always feared it. I mean, for goodness sake, they're dragons. They've killed her enemies. What's going to stop them from killing anyone? Because they're dragons in a, in a non-dragon world. <laughs> they're dragons, Khaleesi. They can never be tamed. I think it's kind of a symbol of her losing control of herself and losing control of what she's doing. The thing that I got most excited about is John is not the same man from season to season. There's too much that's happened to him, too much that's gone on and that he's had to learn from. We find him in season four. He's in a very bad place as far as how he feels he treated he grip and his honor because of that. Not only breaking his vows to the Night's Watch, but breaking his vows to her. He's in a lose-lose position, really. But he has to make good. You've done nothing wrong. I've done plenty wrong. He's reunited with Sam, which is a good thing. But their relationship's changed. Sam and John's relationship this year is, is as even and equal as it's ever been. There's more confrontation between them this season. You're a wildling girl. She's one of the raiders. She's not my girl. Ah, but she was, wasn't she? It's a very different relationship we find themselves in, but still a loving one, still a caring one. And I think without Sam, John would crumble. Oh, that's an easy one. It involves prosthetics. No, that's a big man. Go back and find your clothes, Hodor. <laughs> One of the most terrifying things I've ever had to do was the opening shot of season three. They wanted to get this feeling of something being behind Sam and something in pursuit of Sam. So they decided the only way to achieve that effect was to chase me on a quad bike through the snow. And they had a guy running alongside saying, the only reason I'm here is if you fall over, I'll get the quad bike to stop. I went, thanks very much. I don't know what they're paying you, but it's not enough. Sometimes greeting CGI wolves is a strange experience. It's this big green sausage dummy shoved in your face and you have to treat it as if it's your lifelong pet and love it to bits. It's very odd. The most weird thing I've had to do this season is to bite off a man's ear and spit it in his face. <laughs> the first time I walked into the Castle Black set, I thought, oh my God, because until you step into it physically, when it, it comes out of your head and into the real world, it, it sends chills down your spine, really. Chopping off Theon Greyjoy's companion was probably quite a OMG when I read that. I was like, whoa, really? Every day on this show is an OMG moment, really, because there's always surprises and it. You're always in a really cool location or you've got a great prop or, you know, the set is incredible. The thing that's amazing about the places we shoot is you just don't know what to expect. So you turn up and you're like, wow, this is so much grander than I could have expected or could have ever imagined. The biggest OMG moment is when you think you're nearly finished and then you've got five hours to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nikolai and I um, tried to do a dance number uh, walking down the steps of the court. We thought it was fun. And the, the, the extras were all laughing and, and dancing. But uh, the crew was really tired, and I don't think they responded. And they were just heard from the 80s, like, still rolling, reset. Whenever Maisie's around, there's usually a lot of sleepovers. And like we do a lot of knock and runs on people's hotel doors. <laughs> you know, you'd see Dame Diana Rigg playing, playing backgammon with Daniel Portman. and see Lena giving a massage to someone and everyone's just chatting and joking around and that's a really nice moment.
everyone else gets the badass quotes. I think the best quotes are bronze quotes. Any line he has is witty and intelligent and hilarious. You don't fight with honor. He says, no. He did. Hmm. OK, well, there was that scene where he said, Hodor. Hodor? Hodor. Hodor. Yeah, that, that was definitely a badass one. <laughs> I think it would be when um, Egret's head is on that rock. Strike hard and true, Jon Snow. I'll come back and haunt you. Oh, that was a great line. Well, there's one this year when she's talking about nothing. Maybe nothing is worse than this. Nothing isn't better or worse than anything. Nothing is just nothing. I think that makes you really think about all the different characters and it kind of puts things into perspective. Oh, Dracaris. Dracaris. <laughs> Definitely. I believe that's probably the most badass quote. I think Maester Lewin. He was a very much a, a father figure for Bran, and to not have him, I think, is, is probably a disadvantage to Bran. Be Rob and Catelyn. So hard. The big one that set the, the whole tone for Game of Thrones being known for a show when no one is safe was Ned Stark. And that completely shocked me. I think, as in previous seasons, there's a build. I think what makes this season different is that things really get going much more quickly. It's more thrilling throughout than season three was. There's definitely, objectively, more action, and there are a whole lot of things on the production front that we've never done before. Everyone's kind of now loading the guns, loading their arrows, sharpening their knives, and it's just right. It's not building towards one specific climactic event. There are more climactic events in season four than there have ever been before. Every season up until now has been, episode nine has been the big episode. Season four is just very steady. The stakes are higher throughout the season than they have been before. This season, the story just gets more intense some really juicy mental storylines. <laughs> it's just really exciting. The button's pressed and the, and the accelerator is firmly to the floor here. Um, there's a lot of action. The good guys are coming back this year, and um, that's nice to see. Yeah, we're, we're making a stand. We hope people, when they come out of the season, will, will feel that the impact of, of the season as a whole would be even greater than the impact of the previous season. There are, uh, so many quality shows on television um, that I love and, and admire, but I don't think there's one with the scale of Game of Thrones in terms of the size of the cast, in terms of the um, number of countries we shoot in, and, uh, you know, who else has dragons, really?